Good afternoon. My name is Lindsay Barr, and I'm the accounting manager here at Aileron, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to our next keynote speaker. So as most of you know, Aileron is very passionate about developing the hearts and the minds of our clients. Our next speaker discovered that same passion through her experience in training, facilitation, and coaching. So leadership styles are not a one-size-fits-all, and it can often be a challenge to adapt your style to meet the needs of your people. So with that said, I'm excited to introduce Michelle Schoen of the Kim Blanchard Companies to share her insights on developing people through situational leadership and to give you some takeaways to help you support your team and your success. So please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thanks, Lindsay. Thank you. Well, you guys are a really cute bear. Let me just tell you, I haven't seen a cuter bear out there. Um, I'm Michelle, thank you for having me today. Um, I wanted to start by letting you know that I was born into a small business. And I actually grew up and went to college because of a small business. I've lived and breathed in a small business. And now I work for an amazing small business, the Ken Blanchard Companies. And we support a lot of large companies, but my role in particular is to help support independent contractors, wonderful partners like Aileron that utilize our content, and colleges and universities across the country. I wanted them to play Mellencamp in the background, but that didn't happen, and I didn't see anyone starting to tap their feet when I was doing the small business. But I have a huge passion for it, because like Nicole said, I really feel like you are the heart and the soul of what changes a community and you are what changes people's lives. And at the Blanchard Company, that is what we focus on, is how you help your people. We believe that that is really the future of how your organization will continue to thrive. So as the doc model, and you look at strategy and you look at business development, we too look at it that way, but we look at it a little bit more like a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid is your vision, is your strategy, is your goals, and where you're going. But the bottom is actually your employee engagement. And your employee engagement is all about how do people feel about their jobs? Are they getting their skills developed? Do they know what's expected of them? Is it clear, and do they know what a good job looks like? So often, people don't know what the expectations are. If employee engagement is where it needs to be, then guess what happens to the other part? Customer devotion, there's a direct correlation. And business thrives, results thrive, and it's typically because of the way your people took care of your product, took care of you, and took care of your clients. So we focus on servant leadership at the Blanchard Companies, and it really focuses down to serving your people through leading and giving them direction. And that's kind of the what, and really what Ken wants the legacy of his company to be. The how is situational leadership. And from a show of hands, how many folks in the room are familiar with situational leadership or have heard of it before? Okay, good amount, good amount. The interesting part about what we do and why I love it, I learned it back in 1999, and I believe I learned it in an intellectual property mess up. Um, when I, now that I sell it, I realize they probably shouldn't have trained me the way that they trained me on it. However, I had a huge aha moment when I realized that my competence in a certain role had never been developed. I had a leader that never really had set goals for me, and I knew what was somewhat expected of me because I was driven and I really knew what a good job looked like and I had been successful in the past. But as I was learning about SL2, I had this moment where I realized I left an amazing company and an amazing job because I did not have the competence to do the job. And every time I asked the manager to help me and lead me, they just kept telling me I could do it. You've got it, you're great. Come on, you've got this. And I would leave each time going, I, I must be really losing it. I, I have no idea how to do it. And so at 24 years old, I left a job that I should have never left. 
And sitting in that seat in 1999, I realized I don't want that ever to happen to someone else. So let me tell you about what situational leadership is. It's very much common sense, but not common practice. So we know that people want to know what a good job looks like and that you have clear goals on tasks and things that you want them to do as part of their job. And that they go through set levels of development. They can go through those really quickly or sometimes they can go through them a little bit shorter. The first stage, and if you can, think for yourself a goal or a task that you have going on right now or that you started recently. Typically what happens is someone starts and they're an enthusiastic beginner. They don't have a lot of competence. They don't really exactly know what they're doing, but they're motivated and they're confident they can do it because they've been asked and they've been chosen to do that goal or task. But what happens is shortly as they go through it, they realize, wow, I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm still learning. And as their competence grows, what starts to go down is their motivation and their confidence that they can actually pull it off because they're still learning it. And if they're given the right leadership and the right direction, then they'll be able to move to the next level, which is where they're being able to actually start to do it. But even at that point, their competence has grown, but their commitment can waver because sometimes they have a shorter time period that it has to be done or you've put them in a position where it's a little bit harder than they thought it was going to be. But again, if you support them and you ask them the questions and you share with them a lot of what you've learned here at Aileron about pulling those answers out from them, they'll move on to the final stage, which is a self-reliant achiever. Here's the scary news about it all. That all makes a lot of sense, right? That you go through these development levels and you might be able to piece it together. But as leaders, if I look at this room, there are four different leadership styles that need to match those development levels. Sometimes high direction is needed. You need to be able to tell someone exactly what they need to do, when they need to do it, and how, and you need to show them what that looks like. And you need to provide role clarity. In other times, you need to listen, and listen, and listen, and facilitate self-reliant problem solving because they really know what they're doing. The scary part that I started to tell you is that in this room, 54% of you only use one leadership style. You have something you're comfortable with that you've lived with for a while and it works. 34% of you can use two, only 11% use three, and only 1% can use all four and can shift. And so what we do is we help you get clearer about what is the goal or task that your people are going through, how do you diagnose where they are, and then how can you feel confident giving them what they need to move them past that to receive the results that you need, and they in turn grow and feel better about the work that they're doing. So let me share with you a story that happened right here in Dayton to kind of um, show a couple of these different, these different development levels and a leader that I worked with really make the transition into becoming a situational leader. Good friend of mine owned a salon and one night um, after she's done my hair, we're sitting out um, in the car and she says, listen, I have a really big goal and kind of secret that I haven't told anyone. They're tearing down this building probably within the next two years. So knew it was coming, right? And I really want to expand and open a much larger salon. And I want to bring a blow dry bar to Dayton, Ohio. And I was like, a blow dry bar? What in the world's a blow dry bar? She tells me all the big cities, all the big cities have it. We strategize a little bit that night and I see the passion in her dream, yet, she needs to go from having eight people that work with her to having 25 people work with her. Huge financial investment that she's taking on. The move, moving to an entire, entirely different part of the city. And I say to her, I know she doesn't have the investment. Listen, this is, you know this is what I do for a living. Let me coach you. Let me help you. Let me help you with situational leadership along the way. And... We have the very first meeting, I'm like, you need a leadership team. We pull her leadership team together, 
and they all come prepared. We go through all the work that you've done. We do vision, we do strategies, we do values, things that they had never done before, and we establish that. And then we get to one of the second or third meetings, and we start talking about actually switching to a scheduling, a brand new scheduling system. And people have done the research, people have pulled it all together, her staff comes, they start sharing, and they start sharing what they found and some of the gaps that are coming. She immediately jumps in and says, oh my gosh, this sounds like an issue. I need to call tomorrow and I will cancel this and we'll go back to the old one. The faces on her people absolutely fell. They had already spent almost three months working on this. And I said, just a minute, what's, what's the goal again? Why are we moving to this? Let's get clear, because we have to to move to the new business. So if that's the goal, then we need to stay true to that, and let's determine how we can fix it. So we brainstorm all that, come back around again, and she says, I, I just think we need to stick with what we're doing. We decide to put that on hold, won't share the rest of the story, but the debrief that she and I have after is what happened there? We just took all of the energy. You had your people that were competent, that knew solutions of what to find, and we just kind of steered it off. And she's like, well, that's what I do. I'm the owner. I'm the one that's supposed to make the decisions and make the direction, and I need to do it, and I needed to put a bow on it so that we could move to the next step. Okay, we gotta go back to starting to talk about situational leadership, because what you just had is you had people that were solving your issues. They were capable, they had done the work, but what we just took away from them was their motivation and their confidence. And guess who's now doing the work again? Guess who now took it all back on their plate? So we fast forward about a year and a half. We made the move, we got to this, the system, and scheduling comes up again. But this time, it is how you're actually scheduling all of the folks that work there. Because at this point now, we're good. We've got 25 people. We are hitting our numbers every single month. And we're actually thriving in this new location. What happens at that point, though, is that with all these additional 25 people, what do you think starts to happen? There's a few more customer complaints. There's a few more issues that start to happen with just employees. When all of a sudden you move and you increase your number of employees, you increase really the personal issues that come into a business. And so we had the conversation again about scheduling. And this time, I'm able to say to her, why, why are you still getting involved with the scheduling and of what your people are doing? And she's like, well, I'm not as much anymore. They just tend to still keep coming to me. And I'm like, who on your staff can do it? She can immediately tell me who can do it. And in fact, she can turn around and say, you know what, and they'd actually be a lot better at it than I am. Why? Well, because I'm the creative. I need to be spending my time doing other things. And my operations manager should really own that and could own that. And I was like, well, where would her motivation be in taking that over? She'd probably be really motivated because she wouldn't hear me anymore and I wouldn't walk in and all of a sudden mess up her plan for the day with a scheduling issue. So, we put a plan in place, came in again a month later. I went to the operations manager and I said, how are things going? She's like, it's unbelievable. She doesn't totally side rail my day anymore. I've created all these new ways of scheduling. The employees are happy with us. It's completely made a change in the business. Then I went to my friend and said, okay, how's this going for you? And she's like, oh my gosh. I love not working, uh, worrying about scheduling anymore. She's totally got it down. I'm like, well, let's take this one step further so that you don't continue to kind of run what you want to have happen. Let's start setting up one-on-one -on -one appointments that you have with your leadership team that they bring to you what they need to work on in regards to goals and tasks, and then you spend that time helping develop them based on what they need, when they need it, and what level they need. We put that in place. Start to see it work, and start to see that now we can actually do it with all the stylists. 
And one of the best parts of this is that the leader of the organization, she's phenomenal at what she does. And she sets the vision of where it's going. Now she is spending time with those enthusiastic beginners that have low competence, but really high motivation and confidence. And she is spending time showing them exactly how to do the job. She's developed an apprentice program. They know how much they will make in the next six months to a year. They watch her, she gives them feedback, and she is developing the future of her company by giving those people the right direction that they need and not giving the people that are already competent the direction that they need. She's able to support them and direct the others. And that's the real key to situational leadership. It's diagnosing where are your people and what do they need in terms of support and direction. And when you give them what they need, trust is built, relationships are built, they better serve your clients, and more importantly, you create the atmosphere and the culture that you want to create within your organization. And for me, to watch my friend be able to now tell me what her people need when they need it is an amazing transformation and one that she will say saves her a lot of time in the long run versus her continuing to go down the same path that she always went through in the past. So thank you so much. Enjoy this summit and enjoy everything that you're learning. Thank you.